Section 16 of Pirates of Panama, The Buccaneers of America by A. O. Esquemelin, translated by G. A. Williams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 12. Part 1. Captain Morgan takes the city of Maracaibo on the coast of Nueva Venezuela. Piracies committed in those seas. Ruin of three Spanish ships, set forth to hinder the robberies of the pirates. Not long after their arrival at Jamaica, being that short time they needed to lavish away all the riches above mentioned, they concluded on another enterprise to seek new fortunes. To this effect Captain Morgan ordered all the commanders of his ships to meet at De La Vaca, or the Cow Isle, south of Hispaniola, as is said. Hither flocked to them great numbers of other pirates, French and English, the name of Captain Morgan being now famous in all the neighboring countries for his great enterprises. There was then at Jamaica an English ship newly come from New England, well mounted with thirty-six guns. This vessel, by order of the governor of Jamaica, joined Captain Morgan to strengthen his fleet, and give him greater courage to attempt mighty things. With this supply Captain Morgan judged himself sufficiently strong, but there being in the same place another great vessel of twenty-four iron guns, and twelve brass ones, belonging to the French, Captain Morgan endeavoured also to join this ship to his own, but the French, not daring to trust the English, denied absolutely to consent. The French pirates belonging to this great ship had met at sea an English vessel, and being under great want of victuals, they had taken some provisions out of the English ship, without paying for them, having, perhaps, no ready money aboard only they gave them bills of exchange for Jamaica and Tortuga, to receive money there. Captain Morgan, having notice of this, and perceiving he could not prevail with the French captain to follow him, resolved to lay hold on this occasion, to ruin the French and seek his revenge. Hereupon he invited, with dissimulation, the French commander, and several of his men, to dine with him on board the great ship that was come to Jamaica, as is said. Being come, he made them all prisoners, pretending the injury aforesaid done to the English vessel. This unjust action of Captain Morgan was soon followed by divine punishment, as we may conceive. The manner I shall instantly relate. Captain Morgan, presently after he had taken these French prisoners, called a council to deliberate what place they should first pitch upon in this new expedition. Here it was determined to go to the Isle of Savonia, to wait for the flota then expected from Spain, and take any of the Spanish vessels straggling from the rest. This resolution being taken, they began aboard the great ship to feast one another for joy of their new voyage, and happy counsel, as they hoped. They drank many hells, and discharged many guns, the common sign of mirth among seamen. Most of the men being drunk, by what accident is not known, the ship was suddenly blown up, with three hundred and fifty Englishmen, besides the French prisoners in the hold of all of which there escaped but thirty men, who were in the great cabin, at some distance from the main force of the powder. Many more, it is thought, might have escaped, had they not been so much overtaken with wine. This loss brought much consternation of mind upon the English. They knew not whom to blame, but at last the accusation was laid on the French prisoners, whom they suspected to have fired the powder of the ship out of revenge, though with the loss of their own lives. Hereupon they added new accusations to their former, whereby to seize the ship and all that was in it, by saying the French designed to commit piracy on the English. The grounds of this accusation were given by a commission from the governor of Baracoa, found aboard the French vessel, wherein were these words, that the said governor did permit the French to trade in all Spanish ports, etc., as also to cruise on the English pirates in whatever place soever they find them, because of the multitudes of hostilities which they had committed against the subject of his Catholic majesty, in time of peace betwixt the two crowns. This commission for trade was interpreted as an express order to exercise piracy and war against them, though it was only a bare license for coming into the Spanish ports, the cloak of which permission were those words, that they should cruise upon the English. And though the French did sufficiently expound the true sense of it, yet they could not clear themselves to Captain Morgan, nor his council. But in lieu thereof, the ship and men were seized and sent to Jamaica." Here they also endeavoured to obtain justice, and the restitution of their ship, but all in vain, 
for instead of justice they were long detained in prison and threatened with hanging. Eight days after the loss of the said ship, Captain Morgan commanded the bodies of the miserable wretches who were blown up to be searched for, as they floated on the sea, not to afford them Christian burial, but for their clothes and attire, and if any had gold rings on their fingers, these were cut off, leaving them exposed to the voracity of the monsters of the sea. At last they set sail for Savannah, the place of their assignation. There were in all fifteen vessels, Captain Morgan commanding the biggest, of only fourteen small guns. His number of men was nine hundred and sixty. Few days after, they arrived at the Cabo de Lobos, south of Hispaniola, between Cape Tiburon and Cape Punta de España. Hence they could not pass by reason of contrary winds for three weeks, notwithstanding all the utmost endeavours Captain Morgan used to get forth. Then they doubled a cape, and spied an English vessel at a distance. Having spoken with her, they found she came from England, and bought of her, for ready money, some provisions that they wanted. Captain Morgan proceeded on his voyage till he came to the port of Oka. Here he landed some men, sending them into the woods to seek water and provisions, the better to spare such as he had already on board. They killed many beasts, and among others some horses. But the Spaniards, not well satisfied at their hunting, laid a stratagem for them, ordering three or four hundred men to come from Santo Domingo, not far distant, and desiring them to hunt in all the parts thereabouts near the sea, that so, if the pirates should return, they might find no subsistence. Within few days the same pirates returned to hunt, but finding nothing to kill, a party of about fifty straggled farther on into the woods. The Spaniards, who watched all their motions, gathered a great herd of cows, and set two or three men to keep them. The pirates, having spied them, killed a sufficient number, and though the Spaniards could see them at a distance, yet they could not hinder them at present. But as soon as they attempted to carry them away, they set upon them furiously, crying, Mata! Mata! i.e., Kill! Kill! Thus the pirates were compelled to quit the prey, and retreat to their ships, but they did it in good order, retiring by degrees, and when they had opportunity, discharging full volleys on the Spaniards, killing many of their enemies, though with some loss. The Spaniards, seeing their damage, endeavoured to save themselves by flight, and carry off their dead and wounded companions. The pirates, perceiving them flee, would not content themselves with what hurt they had already done, but pursued them speedily into the woods, and killed the greatest part of those that remained. Next day Captain Morgan, extremely offended at what had passed, went himself with two hundred men into the woods to seek for the rest of the Spaniards, but finding nobody, he revenged his wrath on the houses of the poor and miserable rustics that inhabited those scattering fields and woods, of which he burnt a great number. With this he returned to his ships, somewhat more satisfied in his mind for having done some considerable damage to the enemy, which was always his most ardent desire. The impatience wherewith Captain Morgan had waited a long while for some of his ships not yet arrived, made him resolve to sail away without them, and steer for Savannah, the place he always designed. Being arrived, and not finding any of his ships come, he was more impatient and concerned than before, fearing their loss, or that he must proceed without them. But he was waiting for their arrival a few days longer, and having no great plenty of provisions, he sent a crew of one hundred and fifty men to Hispaniola to pillage some towns near Santo Domingo. But the Spaniards, upon intelligence of their coming, were so vigilant, and in such good posture of defence, that the pirates thought not convenient to assault them, choosing rather to return empty-handed to Captain Morgan than to perish in that desperate enterprise. End of chapter 12, part 1of Pirates of Panama, The Buccaneers of America, by A. O. Esquemelin, translated by G. A. Williams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 12, Part 2 At last Captain Morgan, seeing the other ships did not come, made a review of his people, and found only about five hundred men. The ships wanting were seven, he having only eight in his company, of which the greatest part were very small. Having hitherto resolved to cruise on the coast of Caracas, and to plunder the towns and villages there, finding himself at present with such small forces, 
he changed his resolution by advice of a French captain in his fleet. This Frenchman, having served Lolonois in the like enterprises, and at the taking of Maracaibo, knew all the entries, passages, forces, and means, how to put in execution the same again in company of Captain Morgan, to whom, having made a full relation of all, he concluded to sack it the second time, being himself persuaded, with all his men, of the facility the Frenchman propounded. Hereupon they weighed anchor, and steered towards Curaçao. Being come within sight of it, they landed at another island near it, called Ruba, about twelve leagues from Curaçao to the west. This island, defended by a slender garrison, is inhabited by Indians subject to Spain, and speak Spanish, by reason of the Roman Catholic religion, here cultivated by a few priests sent from the neighboring continent. The inhabitants exercised commerce or trade with the pirates that go or come this way. They buy of the islanders sheep, lambs, and kids, which they exchange for linen, thread, and like things. The country is very dry and barren, the whole substance thereof consisting in those three things, and in a little indifferent wheat. This isle produces many venomous insects, as vipers, spiders, and others. These last are so pernicious that a man bitten by them dies mad, and the manner of recovering such is to tie them very fast both hands and feet, and so to leave them twenty-four hours, without eating or drinking anything. Captain Morgan, as was said, having cast anchor before this island, bought of the inhabitants sheep, lambs, and wood for all his fleet. After two days he sailed again in the night, to the intent that they might not see what course he steered. Next day they arrived at the sea of Maracaibo, taking great care not to be seen from Vigilia, for which reason they anchored out of sight of it. Night being come, they set sail again towards the land, and next morning, by break of day, were got directly over against the bar of the said lake. The Spaniards had built another fort since the action of Lalanois, whence they now fired continually against the pirates, while they put their men into boats to land. The dispute continued very hot, being managed with great courage from morning till dark night. This being come, Captain Morgan, in the obscurity thereof, drew nigh the fort, which having examined, he found nobody in it, the Spaniards having deserted it not long before. They left behind them a match, lighted near a train of powder, to have blown up the pirates and the whole fortress as soon as they were in it. This design had taken effect, had not the pirates discovered it in a quarter of an hour, but Captain Morgan, snatching away the match, saved both his own and his companions' lives. They found here much powder, whereof he provided his fleet, and then demolished part of the walls, nailing sixteen pieces of ordnance, from twelve to twenty-four pounders. Here they also found many muskets and other military provisions. Next day they commanded the ships to enter the bar, among which they divided the powder, muskets, and other things found in the fort. Then they embarked again to continue their course towards Maracaibo. But the waters, being very low, they could not pass a certain bank at the entry of the lake. Hereupon they were compelled to go in canoes and small boats, with which they arrived next day before Maracaibo, having no other defence than some small pieces which they could carry in the said boats. Being landed, they ran immediately to the fort de la Barra, which they found as the precedent, without any person in it, for all were fled into the woods, leaving also the town without any people, unless a few miserable folks who had nothing to lose. As soon as they had entered the town, the pirates searched every corner, to see if they could find any people that were hid, who might offend them unawares. Not finding anybody, every party, as they came out of their several ships, chose what houses they pleased. The church was deputed for the common corps du guard, where they lived after their military manner, very insolently. Next day after they sent a troop of a hundred men to seek for the inhabitants and their goods. These returned next day, bringing with them thirty persons, men, women, and children, and fifty mules laden with good merchandise. All these miserable people were put to the rack, to make them confess where the rest of the inhabitants were, and their goods. Among other tortures, one was to stretch their limbs with cords, and then to beat them with sticks and other instruments. Others had burning matches placed betwixt their fingers, which were thus burnt alive. Others had slender cords or matches twisted about their heads, till their eyes burst out. Thus all inhumane cruelties were executed on those innocent people. Those who would not confess, or who had nothing to declare, 
died under the hands of those villains. These tortures and racks continued for three whole weeks, in which time they sent out daily parties to seek for more people to torment and rob, they never returning without booty and new riches. Captain Morgan, having now gotten into his hands about a hundred of the chief families, with all their goods, at last resolved for Gibraltar, as Lollanois had done before. With this design he equipped his fleet, providing it sufficiently with all necessaries. He put likewise on board all the prisoners, and weighing anchor, set sail with resolution to hazard a battle. They had sent before some prisoners to Gibraltar, to require the inhabitants to surrender, otherwise Captain Morgan would certainly put them all to the sword, without any quarter. Arriving before Gibraltar, the inhabitants received him with continual shooting of great cannon-bullets, but the pirates, instead of fainting hereat, ceased not to encourage one another, saying, We must make one meal upon bitter things, before we come to taste the sweetness of the sugar this place affords. Next day, very early, they landed all their men, and being guided by the Frenchmen above said, they marched towards the town, not by the common way, but crossing through the woods, which way the Spaniards scarce thought they would have come, for at the beginning of their march they made as if they intended to come the next, and open the way to the town, hereby to deceive the Spaniards. But these, remembering full well what Lollanois had done but two years before, thought it not safe to expect a second brunt, and hereupon all fled out of the town as fast as they could, carrying all their goods and riches, as also all the powder, and having nailed all the great guns, so as the pirates found not one person in the whole city, but one poor innocent man who was born a fool. This man they asked whether the inhabitants were fled, and where they had hid their goods. To all which questions and the like he constantly answered, I know nothing, I know nothing, but they presently put him to the rack, and tortured him with cords, which torments forced him to cry out, Do not torture me any more, but come with me, and I will show you my goods and my riches. They were persuaded, it seems, he was some rich person disguised under those clothes so poor, and that innocent tongue. So they went along with him, and he conducted them to a poor, miserable cottage, wherein he had a few earthen dishes, and other things of no value, and three pieces of eight, concealed with some other trumpery underground. Then they asked him his name, and he readily answered, My name is Don Sebastian Sanchez, and I am brother unto the governor of Maracaibo. This foolish answer, it must be conceived, these inhuman wretches took for truth, for no sooner had they heard it, but they put him again upon the rack, lifting him up on high with cords, and tying huge weights to his feet and neck. Besides which, they burnt him alive, applying palm-leaves burning to his face. End of chapter 12, part 2「of Panama, the Buccaneers of America by A. O. Esquemelin, translated by G. A. Williams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 12, Part 3 The same day they sent out a party to seek for the inhabitants, on whom they might exercise their cruelties. These brought back an honest peasant with two daughters of his, whom they intended to torture as they used others, if they showed not the places where the inhabitants were hid. The peasant knew some of those places, and seeing himself threatened with the rack, went with the pirates to show them. But the Spaniards, perceiving their enemies to range everywhere up and down the woods, were already fled thence farther off into the thickest of the woods, where they built themselves huts, to preserve from the weather those few goods they had. The pirates judged themselves deceived by the peasant, and hereupon, to revenge themselves, notwithstanding all his excuses and supplication, they hanged him on a tree. Then they divided into parties to search the plantations, for they knew the Spaniards that were absconded could not live on what the woods afforded, without coming now and then for provisions to their country houses. Here they found a slave, to whom they promised mountains of gold and his liberty, by transporting him to Jamaica, if he would show them where the inhabitants of Gibraltar lay hid. This fellow conducted them to a party of Spaniards, whom they instantly made prisoners, commanding this slave to kill some before the eyes of the rest, that, by this perpetrated crime, he might never be able to leave their wicked company. The negro, according to their orders, committed many murders and insolences upon the Spaniards, and followed the unfortunate traces of the pirates, 
who eight days after returned to Gibraltar with many prisoners, and some mules laden with riches. They examined every prisoner by himself, who were in all about two hundred and fifty persons, where they had hid the rest of their goods, and if they knew of their fellow townsmen. Such as would not confess were tormented after a most inhuman manner. Among the rest there happened to be a Portuguese, who by a negro was reported, though falsely, to be very rich. This man was commanded to produce his riches. His answer was, he had no more than one hundred pieces of eight in the world, and these had been stolen from him two days before by his servant, which words, though he sealed with many oaths and protestations, yet they would not believe him, but dragging him to the rack, without any regard to his age of sixty years, they stretched him with cords, breaking both his arms behind his shoulders. This cruelty went not alone, for he, not being able or willing to make any other declaration, they put him to another sort of torment more barbarous. They tied him with small cords by his two thumbs and his great toes to four stakes fixed in the ground, at a convenient distance, the whole weight of his body hanging on those cords. Not satisfied yet with this cruel torture, they took a stone of above two hundred pounds and laid it upon his belly, as if they intended to press him to death. They also kindled palm-leaves, and applied the flame to the face of this unfortunate Portuguese, burning with them the whole skin, beard, and hair. At last, seeing that neither with these tortures nor others they could get anything out of him, they untied the cords, and carried him half-dead to the church. Where was their corps de garde? Here they tied him anew to one of the pillars thereof, leaving him in that condition, without giving him either to eat or drink, unless very sparingly and so little that would scarce sustain life for some days, four or five being passed, he desired one of the prisoners might come to him, by whose means he promised he would endeavour to raise some money to satisfy their demands. The prisoner whom he required was brought to him, and he ordered him to promise the pirate five hundred pieces of eight for his ransom, but they were deaf and obstinate at such a small sum, and instead of accepting it, beat him cruelly with cudgels, saying, "'Old fellow, instead of five hundred, you must say five hundred thousand pieces of eight, otherwise you shall here end your life.' Finally, after a thousand protestations that he was but a miserable man, and kept a poor tavern for his living, he agreed with them for one thousand pieces of eight. These he raised, and having paid them, got his liberty, though so horribly maimed that it is scarce to be believed he could survive many weeks.' Others were crucified by these tyrants, and with kindled matches burnt between the joints of their fingers and toes, others had their feet put into the fire, and thus were left to be roasted alive. Having used these and other cruelties with the white men, they began to practice the same with the negroes, their slaves, who were treated with no less inhumanity than their masters. Among these slaves there was one who promised Captain Morgan to conduct him to a river of the lake, where he should find a ship and four boats richly laden with goods of the inhabitants of Maracaibo. The same discovered likewise where the governor of Gibraltar lay hid, with the greatest part of the women of the town. But all these he revealed, upon great menaces to hang him, if he told not what he knew. Captain Morgan sent away presently two hundred men in two settees, or great boats, to this river, to seek for what the slave had discovered. But he himself, with two hundred and fifty more, undertook to go and take the governor." This gentleman was retired to a small island in the middle of the river, where he had built a little fort, as well as he could, for his defence. But hearing that Captain Morgan came in person with great forces to seek him, he retired to the top of a mountain not far off, to which there was no ascent but by a very narrow passage, so straight that whosoever did attempt to gain the ascent must march his men one by one. Captain Morgan spent two days before he arrived at this little island, whence he designed to proceed to the mountain where the governor was posted, had he not been told of the impossibility of ascent, not only for the narrowness of the way, but because the governor was well provided with all sorts of ammunition. Besides, there was fallen a huge rain, whereby all the pirates' baggage and powder was wet. By this rain, also, they lost many men at the passage over a river that was overflown. Here perished, likewise, some women and children, and many mules laden with plate and goods, which they had taken from the fugitive inhabitants, so that things were in a very bad condition with Captain Morgan and his men much harassed, as may be inferred from this relation. Whereby, if the Spaniards, in that juncture, had but fifty men well armed, they might have entirely destroyed the pirates. 
but the fears the Spaniards had at first conceived were so great, that the leaves stirring on the trees they often fancied to be pirates. Finally, Captain Morgan and his people, having upon this march sometimes waded up to their middles in water for half or whole miles altogether, they at last escaped, for the greatest part, but the women and children for the major part died. Thus, twelve days after they set forth to seek the governor, they returned to Gibraltar, with many prisoners. Two days after arrived also the two settees that went to the river, bringing with them four boats and some prisoners but the greatest part of the merchandise in the said boats they found not, the Spaniards having unladed and secured it, having intelligence of their coming, who designed also, when the merchandise was taken out, to burn the boats. Yet the Spaniards made not so much haste to unlade these vessels, but that they left in the ship and boats great parcels of goods, which the pirates seized, and brought a considerable booty to Gibraltar. Thus, after they had been in possession of the place five entire weeks, and committed an infinite number of murders, robberies, and such like insolencies, they concluded to depart. But first they ordered some prisoners to go forth into the woods and fields, and collect a ransom for the town, otherwise they would certainly burn it to the ground. These poor, afflicted men went as they were sent, and having searched the adjoining fields and woods, returned to Captain Morgan, telling him they had scarce been able to find anybody, but that to such as they had found they had proposed his demands, to which they had answered, that the governor had prohibited them to give any ransom for the town, but they beseeched him to have a little patience, and among themselves they would collect five thousand pieces of eight, and for the rest they would give some of their own townsmen as hostages, whom he might carry to Maracaibo, till he had received full satisfaction. End of chapter 12, part 3of Pirates of Panama, The Buccaneers of America by A. O. Esquemelin, translated by G. A. Williams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 12, Part 4 Captain Morgan, having now been long absent from Maracaibo, and knowing the Spaniards had had sufficient time to fortify themselves, and hinder his departure out of the lake, granted their proposition, and made as much haste as he could for his departure. He gave liberty to all the prisoners, first putting every one to a ransom, yet he detained the slaves. They delivered him four persons agreed on for hostages of what money more he was to receive, and they desired to have the slave mentioned above, intending to punish him according to his deserts, but Captain Morgan would not deliver him, lest they should burn him alive." At last they weighed anchor, and set sail in all haste for Maracaibo. Here they arrived in four days, and found all things as they had left them. Yet here they received news from a poor, distressed old man, whom alone they found sick in the town, that three Spanish men of war were arrived at the entry of the lake, waiting the return of the pirates. Moreover, that the castle at the entry thereof was again put into a good posture of defence, well provided with guns and men, and all sorts of ammunition. This relation could not choose but disturb the mind of Captain Morgan, who now was careful how to get away through the narrow entry of the lake. Hereupon he sent his swiftest boat to view the entry, and see if things were as they had been related. Next day the boat came back, confirming what was said, assuring him they had viewed the ship so nigh that they had been in great danger of their shot. Hereunto they added that the biggest ship was mounted with forty guns, the second with thirty, and the smallest with twenty-four. These forces, being much beyond those of Captain Morgan, caused a general consternation in the pirates, whose biggest vessel had not above fourteen small guns. Every one judged Captain Morgan to despond, and to be hopeless, considering the difficulty of passing safe with his little fleet amidst these great ships and the fort, or he must perish. How to escape any other way? By sea or land they saw no way. Under these necessities, Captain Morgan resumed new courage, and resolving to show himself still undaunted, he boldly sent a Spaniard to the admiral of those three ships, demanding of him a considerable ransom for not putting the city of Maracaibo to the flames. This man, who was received by the Spaniards with great admiration of the boldness of those pirates, returned two days after, bringing to Captain Morgan a letter from the said admiral, as follows. The letter of Don Alonso del Campo y Espinosa, 
admiral of the Spanish fleet, to Captain Morgan, commander of the pirates. Having understood by all our friends and neighbors the unexpected news that you have dared to attempt and commit hostilities in the countries, cities, towns, and villages belonging to the dominions of His Catholic Majesty, my sovereign lord and master, I let you understand by these lines that I am come to this place, according to my obligation, near that castle which you took out of the hands of a parcel of cowards, where I have put things into a very good posture of defence, and mounted again the artillery which you had nailed and dismounted. My intent is to dispute with you your passage out of the lake, and follow and pursue you everywhere, to the end you may see the performance of my duties. Notwithstanding, if you be contented to surrender with humility all that you have taken, together with the slaves and all other prisoners, I will let you freely pass, without trouble or molestation, on condition that you retire home presently to your own country. But if you make any resistance or opposition to what I offer you, I assure you I will command boats to come from Caracas, wherein I will put my troops, and coming to Maracaibo, will put you every man to the sword. This is my last and absolute resolution. Be prudent, therefore, and do not abuse my bounty with ingratitude. I have with me very good soldiers, who desire nothing more ardently than to revenge on you, and your people, all the cruelties and base infamous actions you have committed upon the Spanish nation in America. Dated on board the royal ship named the Magdalene, lying at anchor at the entry of the Lake Maracaibo, this 24th of April, 1669. Don Alonso del Campo y Espinosa. As soon as Captain Morgan received this letter, he called all his men together in the market-place of Maracaibo, and after reading the contents thereof, both in French and English, asked their advice and resolution on the whole matter, and whether they had rather surrender all they had got to obtain their liberty, than fight for it. They answered all, unanimously, they had rather fight to the last drop of blood, than surrender so easily the booty they had got with so much danger of their lives. Among the rest, one said to Captain Morgan, Take you care for all the rest, and I will undertake to destroy the biggest of those ships with only twelve men. The manner shall be, by making a brulot, or fire-ship, of that vessel we took in the river of Gibraltar, which, to the intent she may not be known for a fire-ship, we will fill her decks with logs of wood, standing with hats and Montera caps, to deceive their sight with the representation of men. The same we will do at all the portholes that serve for guns, which shall be filled with counterfeit cannon. At the stern we will hang out English colours, and persuade them the enemy she is one of our best men of war going to fight them. This proposition was admitted and approved by every one, howbeit their fears were not quite dispersed. For notwithstanding what had been concluded there, they endeavoured to the next day to come to an accommodation with Don Alonso. To this effect Captain Morgan sent to him two persons with these propositions. First, that he would quit Maracaibo, without doing any damage to the town, or exacting any ransom for the firing thereof. Secondly, that he would set at liberty one half of the slaves, and all the prisoners, without ransom. Thirdly, that he would send home freely the four chief inhabitants of Gibraltar, which he had in his custody as hostages for the contributions those people had promised to pay. These propositions were instantly rejected by Don Alonso, as dishonourable. Neither would he hear of any other accommodation, but sent back this message, that if they surrendered not themselves voluntarily into his hands, within two days, under the conditions which he had offered them by his letter, he would immediately come and force them to do it. No sooner had Captain Morgan received this message from Don Alonso than he put all things in order to fight, resolving to get out of the lake by main force, without surrendering anything. First he commanded all the slaves and prisoners to be tied, and guarded very well, and gathered all the pitch, tar, and brimstone they could find in the whole town, for the fire-ship above mentioned. Then they made several inventions of powder and brimstone with palm-leaves, well anointed with tar. They covered very well their counterfeit cannon, laying under every piece many pounds of powder. Besides, they cut down many outworks of the ship, that the powder might exert its strength the better, by breaking open, also, new portholes, where, instead of guns, they placed little drums used by the negroes. Finally, the decks were handsomely beset with many pieces of wood, dressed up like men with hats, or monteras, and armed with swords, muskets, and bandoliers. 
The fire-ship being thus fitted, they prepared to go to the entry of the port. All the prisoners were put into one great boat, and in another of the biggest they placed all the women, plate, jewels, and other rich things. Into others they put the bales of goods and merchandise, and other things of bulk. Each of these boats had twelve men aboard, very well armed. The Brulot had orders to go before the rest of the vessels, and presently to fall afoul with the great ship. All things being ready, Captain Morgan exacted an oath of all his comrades, protesting to defend themselves to the last drop of blood, without demanding quarter, promising withal that whosoever behaved himself thus should be very well rewarded. End of chapter 12, part 4「Pirates of Panama, the Buccaneers of America » by A. O. Esquemelin, translated by G. A. Williams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 12, Part 5 With this courageous resolution they set sail to seek the Spaniards. On April 30th, 1669, they found the Spanish fleet riding at anchor in the middle of the entry of the lake. Captain Morgan, it being now late and almost dark, commanded all his vessels to anchor, designing to fight even all night if they forced him to do it. He ordered a careful watch to be kept aboard every vessel till morning, they being almost within shot, as well as within sight of the enemy. The day dawning, they weighed anchor, and sailed again, steering directly towards the Spaniards, who, seeing them move, did instantly the same. The fire-ship, sailing before the rest, fell presently upon the great ship, and grappled her, which the Spaniards, too late, perceiving to be a fire-ship, they attempted to put her off, but in vain, for the flame seizing her timber and tackling, soon consumed all the stern, the forepart sinking into the sea, where she perished. The second Spanish ship, perceiving the admiral to burn, not by accident, but by industry of the enemy, escaped towards the castle, where the Spaniards themselves sunk her, choosing to lose their ship rather than to fall into the hands of those pirates. The third, having no opportunity to escape, was taken by the pirates. The seamen that sunk the second ship near the castle, perceiving the pirates come towards them to take what remains they could find of their shipwreck, for some part was yet above the water, set fire also to this vessel, that the pirates might enjoy nothing of that spoil." The first ship being set on fire, some of the persons in her swam towards the shore. These pirates would have taken up in their boats, but they would not ask or take quarter, choosing rather to lose their lives than receive them from their hands, for reasons which I shall relate. The pirates being extremely glad at this signal victory so soon obtained, and with so great an inequality of forces, conceived greater pride than they had before, and all presently ran ashore, intending to take the castle. This they found well provided with men, cannon, and ammunition, they having no other arms than muskets, and a few hand grenados. Their own artillery they thought incapable, for its smallness, of making any considerable breach in the walls. Thus they spent the rest of the day, firing at the garrison with their muskets, till the dusk of the evening, when they attempted to advance nearer the walls, to throw in their fireballs. But the Spaniards, resolving to sell their lives as dear as they could, fired so furiously at them, that they having experimented the obstinacy of the enemy, and seeing thirty of their men dead, and as many more wounded, they retired to their ships. The Spaniards, believing the pirates would next day renew the attack with their own cannon, laboured hard all night to put things in order for their coming. Particularly, they dug down and made plain some little hills and eminences, when possibly the castle might be offended." But Captain Morgan intended not to come again, busying himself next day in taking prisoners some of the men who still swam alive, hoping to get part of the riches lost in the two ships that perished. Among the rest he took a pilot, who was a stranger, and who belonged to the lesser ship of the two, of whom he inquired several things, as, what number of people those three ships had in them, whether they expected any more ships to come, from what port they set forth at last, when they came to seek them out. He answered in Spanish, Noble sir, be pleased to pardon and spare me, that no evil be done to me, being a stranger to this nation I have served, and I shall sincerely inform you of all that passed till our arrival at this lake. 
we were sent by orders from the Supreme Council of State in Spain, being six men of war well equipped, into these seas, with instructions to cruise upon the English pirates, and root them out from these parts by destroying as many of them as we could. These orders were given, upon the news brought to the court of Spain of the loss and ruin of Puerto Bello, and other places, of all of which damages and hostilities committed here by the English, dismal lamentations have often been made to the Catholic King and Council, to whom belongs the care and preservation of this new world. And though the Spanish court hath many times by their ambassadors complained hereof to the King of England, yet it hath been the constant answer of His Majesty of Great Britain, that he never gave any letters patent, nor commissions, for acting any hostility against the subjects of the King of Spain. Hereupon the Catholic King resolved to revenge his subjects, and punish these proceedings, commanded six men of war to be equipped, which he sent under the command of Don Augustin de Bustos, admiral of the said fleet. He commanded the biggest ship, named Enes de la Soleda, of forty-eight great guns, and eight small ones. The vice-admiral was Don Alonso del Campo y Espinosa, who commanded the second ship, called La Concepcion, of forty-four great guns, and eight small ones, besides four vessels more, whereof the first was named the Magdalene, of thirty-six great guns, and twelve small ones, with two hundred and fifty men. The second was called the St. Louis, with twenty-six great guns, twelve small ones, and two hundred men. The third was called La Marquesa, of sixteen great guns, eight small ones, and one hundred and fifty men. The fourth and last, N. S. del Carmen, with eighteen great guns, eight small ones, and one hundred and fifty men. Being arrived at Cartagena, the two greatest ships received orders to return to Spain, being judged too big for cruising on these coasts. With the four ships remaining, Don Alonso del Campa y Espinosa departed towards Campeche to seek the English, we arrived at the port there, where, being surprised by a huge storm from the north, we lost one of our ships, being that which I named last. Hence we sailed for Hispaniola, inside of which we came in a few days, and steered for Santo Domingo. Here we heard that there had passed that way a fleet from Jamaica, and that some men thereof had landed at Alta Gracia. The inhabitants had taken one prisoner, who confessed that their design was to go and pillage the city of Caracas. On hearing this news, Don Alonso instantly weighed anchor, and crossing over to the continent, we came in sight of the Caracas. Here we found them not, but met with a boat, which certified us they were in the lake of Maracaibo, and the fleet consisted of seven small ships and one boat. Upon this we came here, and arriving at the entry of the lake, we shot off a gun for a pilot from the shore. Those on land, perceiving we were Spaniards, came willingly to us with a pilot, and told us the English had taken Maracaibo, and that they were now at the pillage of Gibraltar. Don Alonso, on this news, made a handsome speech to his soldiers and mariners, encouraging them to their duty, and promising to divide among them all they should take from the English. He ordered the guns we had taken out of the ship that was lost to be put into the castle, and mounted for its defence, with two eighteen-pounders more, out of his own ship. The pilots conducted us into the port, and Don Alonso commanded the people on shore to come before him, whom he ordered to repossess the castle, and reinforce it with one hundred men more than it had before its being taken. Soon after, we heard of your return from Gibraltar to Maracaibo, whither Don Alonso wrote you a letter, giving you an account of his arrival and design, and exhorting you to restore what you had taken. This you refusing, he renewed his promises to his soldiers and seamen, and having given a very good supper to all his people, he ordered them not to take or give any quarter, which was the occasion of so many being drowned, who dared not to crave quarter, knowing themselves must give none. Two days before you came against us, a negro came aboard Don Alonso's ship, telling him, Sir, be pleased to have great care of yourself, for the English have prepared a fire-ship, with design to burn your fleet. But Don Alonso, not believing this, answered, How can that be? Have they, peradventure, wit enough to build a fire-ship? Or what instruments have they to do it withal? End of chapter 12, part 5of Pirates of Panama, The Buccaneers of America, by A. O. Esquemelin, translated by G. A. Williams. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 12, Part 6 This pilot, having related so distinctly these things to Captain Morgan, was very well used by him, and after some kind proffers made to him, remained in his service. He told Captain Morgan that in the ship which was sunk there was a great quantity of plate, to the value of forty thousand pieces of eight, which occasioned the Spaniards to be often seen in boats about it. Hereupon Captain Morgan ordered one of his ships to remain there, to find ways of getting out of it what plate they could. Meanwhile, himself, with all his fleet, returned to Maracaibo, where he refitted the great ship he had taken, and chose it for himself, giving his own bottom to one of his captains. Then he sent again a messenger to the admiral, who was escaped ashore, and got into the castle, demanding of him a ransom of fire for Maracaibo, which being denied, he threatened entirely to consume and destroy it. The Spaniards considered the ill luck they had all along with those pirates, and not knowing how to get rid of them, concluded to pay the said ransom, although Don Alonso would not consent. Hereupon they sent to Captain Morgan, to know what sum he demanded. He answered that on payment of thirty thousand pieces of eight, and five hundred beeves, he would release the prisoners and do no damage to the town. At last they agreed on twenty thousand pieces of eight, and five hundred beeves to victual his fleet. The cattle were brought the next day, with one part of the money, and while the pirates were busied in salting the flesh, they made up the whole twenty thousand pieces of eight, as was agreed. But Captain Morgan would not presently deliver the prisoners, as he had promised, fearing the shot of the castle at his going forth out of the lake. Hereupon he told them he intended not to deliver them till he was out of that danger, hoping thus to obtain a free passage. Then he set sail with his fleet in quest of the ship he had left, to seek for the plate of the vessel that was burnt. He found her on the place, with fifteen thousand pieces of eight got out of the work, beside many pieces of plate, as hilts of swords and the like, also a great quantity of pieces of eight melted and run together by the force of the fire. Captain Morgan scarce thought himself secure, nor could he contrive how to avoid the shot of the castle. Hereupon he wished the prisoners to agree with the governor to permit a safe passage to his fleet, which, if he should not allow, he would certainly hang them all up in his ships. Upon this the prisoners met, and appointed some of their fellow messengers to go to the said governor, Don Alonso. These went to him, beseeching and supplicating him to have compassion on those afflicted prisoners, who were, with their wives and children, in the hands of Captain Morgan, and that, to this effect, he would be pleased to give his word to let the fleet of pirates freely pass. This being the only way to save both the lives of them that came with this petition, as also of those who remained in captivity, all being equally menaced with the sword and gallows, if he granted them not this humble request. But Don Alonso gave them for answer a sharp reprehension of their cowardice, telling them, If you had been as loyal to your king in hindering the entry of these pirates, as I shall do their going out, you had never caused these troubles, neither to yourselves nor to our whole nation, which hath suffered so much through your pusillanimity. In a word, I shall never grant your request, but shall endeavour to maintain that respect which is due to my king, according to my duty." Thus the Spaniards returned with much consternation, and no hopes of obtaining their request, telling Captain Morgan what answer they had received. His reply was, If Don Alonso will not let me pass, I will find means how to do it without him. Hereupon he presently made a dividend of all they had taken, fearing he might not have an opportunity to do it in another place, if any tempest should rise and separate the ships, as also being jealous that any one of the commanders might run away with the best part of the spoil, which then lay much more in one vessel than another. Thus they all brought in according to their own laws, and declared what they had, first making an oath not to conceal the least thing. The accounts being cast up, they found to the value of twenty-five thousand pieces of eight, in money and jewels, beside the huge quantity of merchandise and slaves, all which purchase was divided to every ship or boat, according to her share. The dividend being made, the question still remained how they should pass the castle and get out of the lake. To this effect they made use of a stratagem as follows. The day before the night wherein they determined to get forth, they embarked many of their men in canoes, 
and rowed towards the shore, as if they designed to land. Here they hid themselves under branches of trees that hung over the coast a while, laying themselves down in the boats. Then the canoes returned to the ships, with the appearance of only two or three men rowing them back, the rest being unseen at the bottom of the canoes. Thus much only could be perceived from the castle, and this false landing of men, for so we may call it, was repeated that day several times. This made the Spaniards think the pirates intended at night to force the castle by scaling it. This fear caused them to place most of their great guns on the land side, together with their main force, leaving the side towards the sea almost destitute of defence. Night being come, they weighed anchor, and by moonlight, without setting sail, committed themselves to the ebbing tide, which gently brought them down the river, till they were near the castle, being almost over against it, they spread their sails with all possible haste. The Spaniards, perceiving this, transported with all speed their guns from the other side, and began to fire very furiously at them. But these, having a very favourable wind, were almost past danger before those of the castle could hurt them, so that they lost few of their men, and received no considerable damage in their ships. Being out of the reach of the guns, Captain Morgan sent a canoe to the castle with some of the prisoners, and the governor thereof gave them a boat to return to their own homes. But he detained the hostages from Gibraltar, because the rest of the ransom for not firing the place was yet unpaid. Just as he departed, Captain Morgan ordered seven great guns with bullets to be fired against the castle, as it were, to take his leave of them, but they answered not so much as with a musket shot. Next day after, they were surprised with a great tempest, which forced them to cast anchor in five or six fathom water, but the storm increasing compelled them to weigh again and put to sea, where they were in great danger of being lost, for if they should have been cast on shore, either into the hands of the Spaniards or Indians, they would certainly have obtained no mercy. At last, the tempest being spent, the wind ceased, to the great joy of the whole fleet. While Captain Morgan made his fortune by these pillagings, his companions, who were separated from his fleet at the Cape de Lobos, to take the ship spoken of before, endured much misery, and were unfortunate in all their attempts. Being arrived at Savannah, they found not Captain Morgan there, nor any of their companions, nor had they the fortune to find a letter which Captain Morgan, at his departure, left behind him in a place where, in all probability, they would meet with it. Thus, not knowing what course to steer, they concluded to pillage some town or other. They were in all about four hundred men, divided into four ships and one boat. Being ready to set forth, they constituted an admiral among themselves, being one who had behaved himself very courageously at the taking of Portobello, named Captain Hansel. This commander attempting the taking of the town of Camagna, on the continent of Caracas, nigh sixty leagues to the west of the Isle de la Trinidad. Being arrived there, they landed their men, and killed some few Indians near the coast. But approaching the town, the Spaniards having in their company many Indians, disputed the entry so briskly, that with great loss and confusion, they were forced to retire to the ships. At last they arrived in Jamaica, where the rest of their companions, who came with Captain Morgan, mocked and jeered them for their ill success at Camagna, often telling them, "'Let us see what money you have brought from Camagna, and if it be as good silver as that which we bring from Maracaibo.'" End of chapter 12, part 6 End of chapter 12twenty two of Pirates of Panama The Buccaneers of America by A. O. Esquemelin Translated by G. A. Williams This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Heather and By Chapter thirteen Captain Morgan goes to Hispaniola to equip a new fleet with intent to pillage again on the coast of the West Indies. Captain Morgan perceived now that fortune favoured him, by giving success to all his enterprises, which occasioned him, as is usual in human affairs, to aspire to greater things, trusting she would always be constant to him. Such was the burning of Panama, wherein fortune failed not to assist him, as she had done before, though she had led thereto through a thousand difficulties. The history hereof I shall now relate, being so remarkable in all its circumstances, as peradventure nothing more deserving memory will be read by future ages. 
Captain Morgan, arriving at Jamaica, found many of his officers and soldiers reduced to their former indigency, by their vices and debaucheries. Hence they perpetually importuned him for new exploits. Captain Morgan, willing to follow fortune's call, stopped the mouths of many inhabitants of Jamaica, who were creditors to his men for large sums, with the hopes and promises of greater achievements than ever, by a new expedition. This done, he could easily levy men for any enterprise, his name being so famous through all those islands, as that alone would readily bring him in more men than he could well employ. He undertook, therefore, to equip a new fleet, for which he assigned the south side of Tortuga as a place of rendezvous, writing letters to all the expert pirates there inhabiting, as to the governor, and to the planters and hunters of Hispaniola, informing them of his intentions, and desiring their appearance, if they intended to go with him. These people, upon this notice, flocked to the place assigned, in huge numbers, with ships, canoes, and boats, being desirous to follow him. Many, who had not the convenience of coming by sea, traversed the woods of Hispaniola, and with no small difficulties arrived there by land. Thus all were present at the place assigned, and ready against October twenty fourth, 1670. Captain Morgan was not wanting to be there punctually, coming in his ship to Port Cullion, over against the island de la Vaca, the place assigned. Having gathered the greatest part of his fleet, he called a council to deliberate about finding provisions for so many people. Here they concluded to send four ships and one boat, with four hundred men, to the continent, in order to rifle some country towns and villages for all the corn or maize they could gather. They set sail for the continent towards the river de la Hacha, designing to assault the village called La Rancheria, usually best stored with maize of all the parts thereabouts. Meanwhile, Captain Morgan sent another party to hunt in the woods, who killed a huge number of beasts and salted them. The rest remained in the ships to clean, fit, and rig them, that at the return of their fellows all things might be in readiness to weigh anchor and follow their designs. End of chapter 13three of pirates of panama the buccaneers of america by a o esquemelin translated by g a williams this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by heather and by chapter fourteen what happened in the river de la hacha these four ships, setting sail from Hispaniola, steered for the river de la Hacha, where they were suddenly overtaken with a tedious calm. Being within sight of land becalmed for some days, the Spaniards inhabiting along the coast, who had perceived them to be enemies, had sufficient time to prepare themselves, at least to hide the best of their goods, that without any care of preserving them they might be ready to retire, if they proved unable to resist the pirates, by whose frequent attempts on those coasts they had already learned what to do in such cases. There was then in the river a good ship, come from Cartagena, to lade with maize, and now almost ready to depart. The men of this ship endeavoured to escape, but not being able to do it, both they and the vessel fell into their hands. This was a fit purchase for them, being a good part of what they came for. Next morning, about break of day, they came with their ships ashore, and landed their men, though the Spaniards made good resistance from a battery they had raised on that side, where of necessity they were to land, but they were forced to retire to a village, whither the pirates followed them. Here the Spaniards rallying fell upon them with great fury, and maintained a strong combat, which lasted till night, but then, perceiving they had lost a great number of men, which was no less on the pirates' side, they retired to secret places in the woods. Next day the pirates, seeing them all fled, and the town left empty of people, they pursued them as far as they could, and overtook a party of Spaniards, whom they made prisoners, and exercised with most cruel torments, to discover their goods. Some were forced, by intolerable tortures, to confess, but others who would not were used more barbarously. Thus, in fifteen days that they remained there, they took many prisoners, much plate and movables, with which booty they resolved to return to Hispaniola, Yet, not content with what they had got, they dispatched some prisoners into the woods to seek for the rest of the inhabitants, and to demand a ransom for not burning the town. They answered they had no money nor plate, 
but if they would be satisfied with a quantity of maize, they would give as much as they could. The pirates accepted this, it being then more useful to them than ready money, and agreed they should pay four thousand hennigs, or bushels of maize. These were brought in three days after, the Spaniards being desirous to rid themselves of that inhuman sort of people. Having laded them on board with the rest of their purchase, they returned to Hispaniola, to give account to their leader, Captain Morgan, of all they had performed. They had now been absent five weeks on this commission, which long delay occasioned Captain Morgan almost in despair of their return, fearing lest they were fallen into the hands of the Spaniards, especially considering the place whereto they went could be easily relieved from Cartagena and Santa Maria, if the inhabitants were careful to alarm the country. On the other side he feared lest they should have made some great fortune in that voyage, and with it to have escaped to some other place. But seeing his ships return in greater numbers than they departed, he resumed new courage, this sight causing both him and his companions infinite joy, especially when they found them full laden with maize, which they much wanted for the maintenance of so many people, from whom they expected great matters under such a commander. Captain Morgan, having divided the said maize, as also the flesh which hunters brought, among his ships, according to the number of men, he concluded to depart, having viewed beforehand every ship, and observed their being well equipped and clean. Thus he set sail, and stood for Cape Tiburon, where he determined to resolve what enterprise he should take in hand. No sooner were they arrived, but they met some other ships newly come to join them from Jamaica, so that now their fleet consisted of thirty-seven ships, wherein were two thousand fighting men, besides mariners and boys. The admiral hereof was mounted with twenty-two great guns, and six small ones of brass. The rest carried some twenty, some sixteen, some eighteen, and the smallest vessels at least four, besides which they had great quantities of ammunition and fireballs, with other inventions of powder. Captain Morgan, having such a number of ships, divided the whole fleet into two squadrons, constituting a vice-admiral and other officers of the second squadron, distinct from the former. To these he gave letters patent, or commissions to act all manner of hostilities against the Spanish nation, and to take of them what ships they could, either abroad at sea or in the harbours, as if they were open and declared enemies, as he termed it, of the King of England, his pretended master. This done, he called all his captains and other officers together, and caused them to sign some articles of agreement betwixt them, and in the name of all. Herein it was stipulated that he should have the hundredth part of all that was gotten to himself, that every captain should draw the shares of eight men for the expenses of his ship, besides his own. To the surgeon, besides his pay, two hundred pieces of eight for his chest of medicaments. To every carpenter above his salary, one hundred pieces of eight. The rewards were settled in this voyage much higher than before, as for the loss of both legs fifteen hundred pieces of eight, or fifteen slaves, the choice left to the party, for the loss of both hands eighteen hundred pieces of eight, or eighteen slaves, for one leg, whether the right or left, six hundred pieces of eight, or six slaves, for a hand, as much as for a leg, and for the loss of an eye one hundred pieces of eight, or one slave." Lastly, to him that in any battle should signalize himself, either by entering first any castle, or taking down the Spanish colors, and setting up the English, they allotted fifty pieces of eight for a reward. All which extraordinary salaries and rewards to be paid out of the first spoil they should take, as every one should occur to be either rewarded or paid. This contract being signed, Captain Morgan commanded his vice-admirals and captains to put all things in order, to attempt one of these three places, either Cartagena, Panama, or Veracruz. But the lot fell on Panama, as the richest of all three, though this city being situate at such a distance from the North Sea, as they knew not well the approaches to it, they judged it necessary to go beforehand to the Isle of St. Catherine, there to find some persons for guides in this enterprise. For in the garrison there are commonly many banditti and outlaws belonging to Panama and the neighboring places, who are very expert in knowledge of that country. Before they proceeded, they published an act through the whole fleet, promising, if they met with any Spanish vessel, the first captain who should take it should have for his reward the tenth part of what should be found in her. End of chapter 14 Between four of Pirates of Panama, the Buccaneers of America, by A. O. X. Mellon 
translated by G. A. Williams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vernon Yell. Chapter 15 Captain Morgan leaves Espanola and goes to St. Catherine's, which he takes. Captain Morgan and his companions weighed anchor from the Cape of Tiburon, December 16, 1670. Four days after they arrived in sight of St. Catherine's, now in possession of the Spaniards again, as I said before, to which they commonly banish the malefactors of the Spanish dominions in the West Indies. Here are huge quantities of pigeons at certain seasons. It is watered by four rivulets, whereof two are always dry in summer. Here is no trade or commerce exercised by the inhabitants, neither do they plant more fruit than what are necessary for human life, though the country would make very good plantations of tobacco of considerable profit, were it cultivated. As soon as Captain Morgan came near the island with his feet, he sent one of his best sailing vessels to view the entry of the river, and see if any other ships were there, who might hinder him from landing, as also fearing lest they should give intelligence of his arrival to the inhabitants, and prevent his designs. The next day, before sunrise, all the fleet anchored near the island in a bay called Aguadi Grande. On this bay the Spaniards had built a battery, mounted with four pieces of cannon, Captain Morgan landed about one thousand men in divers squadrons, marching through the wood. Though they had no other guides than a few of his own men, who had been there before under men's fault. The same day they came to a place where the governor sometimes resided. Here they found a battery called the platform, but nobody in it, the Spaniards having retired to the lesser island, which, as I said before, is so near the great one, that a short bridge only may conjoin them. This lesser island was so well fortified with forts and batteries around it, as might seem impregnable. Hereupon, as soon as the Spaniards perceived the pirates' approach, they fired on them so furiously that they could advance nothing that day, but were content to retreat and take up their rest in the open fields, which was not strange to these people, being sufficiently used to such kind of repose. What most afflicted them was hunger, having not eaten anything that whole day. About midnight it rained so hot that they had much ado to bear it, the greatest part of them having no other clothes than a pair of seamen's trousers or breeches, and a shirt, without shoes or stockings. In this great extremity they pulled down a few thatched houses to make fires withal. In the work they were in such a condition that one hundred men, indifferently well armed, might easily that night have torn them all in pieces. Next morning, about break of day, the rain ceased, and they dried their arms and marched on. But soon after it rained afresh, rather harder than before, as if the skies were melted into waters, which kept them from advancing towards the fort, whence the Spaniards continually fired at them. The pirates were now reduced to great affliction and danger, through the hardness of the weather, their own nakedness, and great hunger. For a small relief hereof, they found in fields an old horse, lean and full of scabs and bulges, with gold back and sides. This they instantly killed and fate, and divided in small pieces among themselves, as well as the word reach. For many could not get a morsel, which they roasted and devoured without salt or bread, more like ravenous wolves than men. The rain not ceasing, Captain Morgan perceived their minds to relent, hearing many of them say they would return on board. Among these fatigues of mind and body, he thought convenient to use some sudden remedy. To this effect, he commanded a canoe to be rigged in haste, and colours of truce to be hanged out. This canoe he sent to the Spanish governor, with his message, that if within a few hours he divert not himself and all his men into his hand, he did by that messenger swear to him, and all those that were in his company, he would most certainly put them to his sword, without granting quarter to any. In the afternoon the canoe returned with this answer, that the governor desired two hours' time to deliberate with his officers about it, which being passed, he would give his positive answer. The time being lapsed, the governor sent two canoes with white colours, and two persons to treat with Captain Morgan, but before they landed, they demanded of the pirates two persons as hostages. 
These were readily granted by Captain Morgan, who delivered two of the captains for a pledge of the security required. With this, the Spaniards propounded to Captain Morgan that the governor in the full assembly had resolved to deliver up the island, not being provided with sufficient forces to defend it against such an armada. But withal, he desired Captain Morgan would be pleased to use a certain stratagem of war for the better saving of his own credit and the reputation of his officers both abroad and at home, which should be as follows, that Captain Morgan would come with his troops by night to a bridge that joined the lesser island to Great One, and there attack the fort of St. Jerome, that at the same time all his feet would draw near the castle of Santa Teresa, and attack it by land, landing, and meanwhile, more troops near the battery of St. Matthew, that these troops being newly landed, should by these means intercept the governor, as he endeavoured to pass to St. Jerome's fort, and then take him prisoner, using the formality as if they forced him to burn the castle, and that he would lead the English into it, under colour of being his own troops. That on both sides there should be continual firing, but without bullets, or at least into the air, so that no sight might be heard. That thus having obtained two such considerable forts, the chiefest of the isle, he need not take care for the rest, which was full of course into his hand. These propositions were granted by Captain Morgan, on condition they should see them faithfully observed, otherwise they should be used with the utmost rigour. This they promised to do, and took their leave, to give account of their negotiation to the governor. Presently after, Captain Morgan commanded the whole fleet to enter the port, as is meant to be ready to assault that night the castle of St. Jerome. Thus the false battle began, with incessant firing from both the castles against the ships, but without bullets, as was agreed. Then the pirates landed, and assaulted by night the lesser island, which they took, as also both fortresses, forcing the Spaniards, and appearance to fly to church. Before this assault, Captain Morgan sent word to the governor that he should keep all his men together in a body. Otherwise, if the pirates met any shrinking Spaniards in the streets, they should certainly shoot them. This island being taken by this unusual stratagem, and all things put in order, the pirates made a new war against poultry, cattle, and all sorts of victuals they could find, for some days scarce thinking of anything else than kill, roast and eat, and make what good cheer they could. If wood was wanting, they pulled down the houses and made fires with the timber, as had been done before in the field. Next day they numbered all the prisoners they had taken upon the island, which were found to be in all four hundred and fifty-nine persons, men, women, and children. It permitted to be seen one hundred and ninety soldiers of the garrison, forty inhabitants, who were married, forty-three children, thirty-four slaves, belonging to the king, with eight children, eight bantity, thirty-nine negroes belonging to private persons, with twenty-seven female blacks, and thirty-four children. The pirates disarmed all the Spaniards, and sent them out immediately to the plantations to seek for provisions, leaving the women in the church to exercise their devotions. Soon after they reviewed the whole island, and all the fortresses thereof, which they found to be nine in all, is permitted to be seen the fort of St. Jerome, next to the bridge, had eight great guns of twelve, six, and eight pounds carriage, with six pipes of musket, every pipe containing ten muskets. Here they found still sixty muskets, with sufficient powder and other ammunition. The second fortress, called St. Matthew, had three guns, of eight pounds each. The third, and chiefest, named Santa Teresa, had twenty great guns of eighteen, twelve, eight, and six pounds, with ten pipes of muskets, like those before, and ninety muskets remaining, besides other ammunition. This castle was built with stone and mortar, with very thick walls, and a large ditch round it, twenty feet deep, which, though it was dry, yet was very hard to get over. Here was no entry, but through one door, to the middle of the castle. Within it was a mount, almost inaccessible, with four pieces of cannon at the top, whence they could shoot directly into a port. On the seaside it was impregnable by reason of the rocks round it, and the sea beating furiously upon them. 
The land that was still commonly sea seated on the mountain, as there was no access to it but by a path three or four feet broad. The fourth fortress was named St. Augustine, having three guns of eight and six pounds. The fifth, named La Plataforma de la Concepcion, only had two guns of eight pounds. The sixth, by name San Salvador, had likewise no more than two guns. The seventh, called Plataforma de los Ardileros, had also two guns. The eighth, called Santa Cruz, had three guns. The ninth, called St. Joseph's Fort, had six guns, of twelve and eight pounds, besides two pipes of muskets, and sufficient ammunition. In the storehouses were about thirty thousand pounds of powder, with all other ammunition, which was carried by the pirates on board. All the guns were stopped and nailed, and the fortresses demolished, except that of St. Jerome, where the pirates kept guard and resistance. Captain Morgan inquired for any banditti from Panama or Petabello, and three were brought him, who pretended to be very expert in the avenues of those parts. He asked them to be his guides, and show him the securest ways to Panama, which, if they performed, he promised them equal shares in Panda of the expedition, and their liberty when they arrived in Jamaica. These propositions the banditti readily accepted, promising to serve him very faithfully, especially one of the three, who was the greatest rogue, thief, and assassin among them, who had deserved rather to be broken alive on the wheel than punished with serving in a garrison. This wicked fellow had a great ascendant over the other two, and dominated over them as he pleased, they not daring to disobey his orders. Captain Morgan commanded four ships and one boat to be equipped, and provided with necessaries to go and take the castle of Chagra, on the river of that name. Neither would he go himself with his whole fleet, lest the Spaniards should be jealous of his father's design on Panama. In these vessels he embarked four hundred men to put in execution these his orders. Meanwhile, himself remained in St. Catherine's with the rest of the fleet, expecting to hear of their success. End of chapter 15five of Pirates of Panama, The Buccaneers of America, by A. O. X. Quemelin, translated by G. A. Williams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. Chapter 16 Captain Morgan takes the castle of Chagre, with four hundred men sent to this purpose from St. Catherine's. Captain Morgan, sending this little fleet to Chagre, chose for vice-admiral thereof one Captain Broadly, who had been long in those quarters, and committed many robbers on the Spaniards when Mansfeld took the Isle of St. Catherine, as was before related and therefore was thought a fit person for this exploit. His actions likewise having rendered him famous among the pirates, and their enemies the Spaniards. Captain Broadley, being made commander, in three days after his departure arrived in sight of the said castle of Chagre, by the Spaniards call St. Lawrence. This castle is built on a high mountain, at the entry of the river, surrounded by strong palisades or wooden walls filled with earth which secures them as well as the best wall of stone or brick the top of this mountain is in a manner divided into two parts between which is a ditch thirty feet deep the castle has but one entry and that by a drawbridge over this ditch to the land it has four bastions, and to the sea two more. The south part is totally inaccessible through the cragginess of the mountain. The north is surrounded by the river, which here is very broad. At the foot of the castle, or rather mountain, is a strong fort, with eight great guns, commanding the entry of the river. Not much lower are two other batteries, each of six pieces, to defend likewise the mouth of the river. 
At one side of the castle are two great storehouses of all sorts of warlike ammunition and merchandise, brought thither from the island country. Near these houses is a high pair of stairs hewn out of the rock, to mount to the top of the castle. On the west is a small port, not above seven or eight fathoms deep, fit for small vessels, and of very good anchorage. Besides, before the castle, at the entry of the river, is a great rock, scarce to be described but at low tides. No sooner had the Spaniards perceived the pirates, but they fired incessantly at them, with the biggest of their guns. They came to an anchor in a small port about a league from the castle. Next morning, very early, they went ashore and marched through the woods to attack the castle on that side. This march lasted till two o'clock in the afternoon, before they could reach the castle, by reason of the difficulties of the way, and its mire and dirt. And though their guides served them very exactly, yet they came so nigh the castle at first that they lost many of their men by its shot, they being in an open place without covert. This much perplexed the pirates, not knowing what course to take, for on that side of necessity they must make the assault, and being uncovered from head to foot, they could not advance one step without danger. Besides that, the castle, both for its situation and strength, made them much doubt of success. But to give it over they dared not, lest they should be reproached by their companions. At last, after many doubts and disputes, resolving to hazard the assault, and their lives desperately. They advanced towards the castle with their swords in one hand and fireballs in the other. The Spaniards defended themselves very briskly, ceasing not to fire at them continually, crying withal, Come on, ye English dogs, enemies to God and our King, and let your other companions that are behind come on too. Ye shall not go to Panama this bout. The pirates, making some trial to climb the walls, were forced to retreat, resting themselves till night. This being come, they returned to the assault, to try, by the help of their fireballs, to destroy the pales before the wall. And while they were about it, there happened a very remarkable accident, which occasioned their victory. One of the pirates, being wounded with an arrow in his back, which pierced his body through, he pulled it out boldly at the side of his breast, and winding a little cotton about it, he put it into his musket, and shot it back to the castle. But the cotton being kindled by the powder, fired two or three houses in the castle, being thatched with palm leaves which the Spaniards perceived not so soon as was necessary. For this fire meeting with a parcel of powder blew it up, thereby causing great ruin, and no less consternation to the Spaniards, who were not able to put a stop to it, not having seen it time enough. The pirates, perceiving the effect of the arrow, and the misfortunes of the Spaniards, were infinitely glad and while they were busied in quenching the fire, which caused a great confusion for want of water, the pirates took this opportunity, setting fire likewise to the palisades. The fire thus seen at once in several parts about the castle gave them great advantage against the Spaniards, many breaches being made by the fire among the pales, great heaps of earth falling into the ditch. Then the pirates climbing up got over into the castle, though those Spaniards who were not busy about the fire cast down many flaming pots, full of combustible matter and odious smells, which destroyed many of the English. The Spaniards, with all their resistance, could not hinder the palisades from being burnt down before midnight. Meanwhile the pirates continued in their intention of taking the castle. 
and though the fire was very great, they would creep on the ground as near as they could, and shoot amidst the flames against the Spaniards on the other side, and thus killed many from the walls. When day was come, they observed all the movable earth that lay betwixt the pales to be fallen into the ditch, so that now those within the castle lay equally exposed to them without, as had been on the contrary before, whereupon the pirates continued shooting very furiously, and killed many Spaniards, for the governor had charged them to make good those posts, answering to the heaps of earth fallen into the ditch, and caused the artillery to be transported to the breaches. The fire within the castle still continuing, the pirates from abroad did what they could to hinder its progress by shooting incessantly against it. One party of them was employed only for this, while another watched all the motions of the Spaniards. About noon the English gained a breach which the governor himself defended with twenty-five soldiers. Here was made a very courageous resistance by the Spaniards, with muskets, pikes, stones, and swords, but through all these the pirates fought their way till they gained the castle. The Spaniards, who remained alive, cast themselves down from the castle into the sea, choosing rather to die thus, few or none surviving the fall, than to ask quarter for their lives. The governor himself retreated to the corpse to guard, before which were placed two pieces of cannon. Here he still defended himself, not demanding any quarter, till he was killed with a musket shot in the head. The governor being dead, and the corpse to guard surrendering, they found remaining in it alive thirty men, whereof scarce ten were not wounded. These informed the pirates that eight or nine of their soldiers had deserted, and were gone to Panama to carry news of their arrival and invasion. These thirty men alone remained of three hundred and fourteen, wherewith the castle was garrisoned, among which not one officer was found alive. These were all made prisoners, and compelled to tell whatever they knew of their designs and enterprises. Among other things, that the governor of Panama had notice sent him three weeks ago from Cartagena, that the English were equipping a fleet at Hispaniola, with a design to take Panama, and, beside, that this had been discovered by a deserter from the pirates at the river de la Hacha, where they had victualled that upon this the governor had sent one hundred and sixty-four men to strengthen the garrison of that castle, with much provision and ammunition. The ordinary garrison whereof was only one hundred and fifty men, but these made up two hundred and fourteen men, very well armed. Besides this, they declared that the governor of Panama had placed several ambuscades along the river of Chagre, and that he waited for them in the open fields of Panama with three thousand six hundred men. The taking of this castle cost the pirates excessively dear in comparison to what they were wont to lose, and their toil and labour was greater than at the conquest of the Isle of St. Catherine, for, numbering their men, they had lost above a hundred besides seventy wounded. They commanded the Spanish prisoners to cast the dead bodies of their own men from the top of the mountain to the seaside, and to bury them. The wounded were carried to the church, of which they made an hospital, and where also they shut up the women. Captain Morgan remained not long behind at St. Catherine's, after taking the castle of Chagre, of which he had noticed presently, but before he departed, he embarked all the provisions that could be found, with much maize or Indian wheat and cassave, whereof also is made bread in those ports. He transported great store of provisions to the garrison of Chagre, whence soever they could be got. At a certain place they cast into the sea all the guns belonging thereto, designing to return and leave that island well garrisoned, 
to the perpetual possession of the pirates, but he ordered all the houses and forts to be fired, except the castle of St. Teresa, which he judged to be the strongest and securest wherein to fortify himself at his return from Panama. Having completed his arrangements, he took with him all the prisoners of the island, and then sailed for Chagre, where he arrived in eight days. Here the joy of the whole fleet was so great when they spied the English colours on the castle, that they minded not their way into the river, so that they lost four ships at the entry thereof, Captain Morgan's being one. Yet they saved all the men and goods. The ships too had been preserved, if a strong northerly wind had not risen, which cast them on the rock at the entry of the river. Captain Morgan was brought into the castle with great acclamations of all the pirates, both of those within and those newly come. Having heard the manner of the conquest, he commanded all the prisoners to work and repair what was necessary, especially to set up new palisades round the forts of the castle. There were still in the river some Spanish vessels, called Chatton, serving for transportation or merchandise up and down the river, and to go to Puerto Bello and Nicaragua. These commonly carry two great guns of iron and four small ones of brass. These vessels they seized, with four little ships they found there, and all the canoes. In the castle they left a garrison of five hundred men, and in the ships in the river one hundred and fifty more. This done, Captain Morgan departed for Panama at the head of twelve hundred men. He carried little provisions with him, hoping to provide himself sufficiently among the Spaniards, whom he knew to lie in ambuscade by the way. End of chapter 16 Read by Lars Rolander Twenty-six of Pirates of Panama The Buccaneers of America by A. O. X. Cumelang Translated by G. A. Williams This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander Chapter 17, Part 1 Captain Morgan departs from Chagre, at the head of twelve hundred men, to take the city of Panama. Captain Morgan set forth from the castle of Chagre towards Panama, August 18, 1670. He had with him twelve hundred men, five boats laden with artillery, and thirty-two canoes. The first day they sailed only six leagues, and came to a place called De Los Brachos. Here a party of his men went ashore only to sleep and stretch their limbs, being almost crippled with lying too much crowded in the boats. Having rested a while, they went abroad to seek victuals in the neighboring plantations, but they could find none, the Spaniards being fled and carrying with them all they had. This day being the first of their journey, they had such scarcity of victuals as the greatest part were forced to pass with only a pipe of tobacco without any other refreshment. Next day, about evening, they came to a place called Cruz de Juan Gallego. Here they were compelled to leave their boats and canoes, the river being very dry for want of rain, and many trees having fallen into it. The guides told them that about two leagues farther, the country would be very good to continue the journey by land. Hereupon they left one hundred and sixty men on board the boats to defend them, that they might serve for a refuge in necessity. Next morning, being the third day, they all went ashore, except those who were to keep the boats. To these Captain Morgan gave order, under great penalties, that no man, on any pretext whatever, should dare to leave the boats and go ashore. 
fearing lest they should be surprised by an ambuscade of Spaniards in the neighbouring woods, which appeared so thick as to seem almost impenetrable. This morning, beginning their march, the ways proved so bad that Captain Morgan thought it more convenient to transport some of the men in canoes, though with great labour, to a place farther up the river called Cedro Bueno. Thus they re-embarked, and the canoes returned for the rest, so that about night they got all together at the said place. The pirates much desired to meet some Spaniards or Indians, hoping to fill their bellies with their provisions, being reduced to extremity and hunger. The fourth day the greatest part of the pirates marched by land, being led by one of the guides, the rest went by water farther up, being conducted by another guide, who always went before them to discover, on both sides the river, the ambuscades. These had also spies, who were very dexterous to give notice of all accidents, or of the arrival of the pirates, six hours at least before they came. This day, about noon, they came near a post called Torna Cavallos. Here the guide of the canoes cried out that he perceived an ambuscade. His voice caused infinite joy to all the pirates, hoping to find some provisions to satiate their extreme hunger. Being come to the place, they found nobody in it, the Spaniards being fled, and leaving nothing behind but a few leathern bags all empty, and a few crumbs of bread scattered on the ground where they had eaten. Being angry at this, they pulled down a few little huts which the Spaniards had made, and fell to eating the leathern bags, to allay the ferment of their stomachs, which was now so sharp as to gnaw their very bowels. Thus they made a huge banquet upon these bags of leather, diverse quarrels arising concerning the greatest shares. By the bigness of the place they conjectured about five hundred Spaniards had been there, whom, finding no victuals, they were now infinitely desirous to meet, intending to devour some of them rather than perish. Having feasted themselves with those pieces of leather, they marched on till they came about night to another post called Torna Munni, here they found another ambuscade, but as barren as the former. They searched the neighbouring woods, but could not find anything to eat, the Spaniards having been so provident as not to leave anywhere the least crumb of sustenance, whereby the pirates were now brought to this extremity. Here again he was happy that had reserved since noon any bit of leather to make his supper of drinking after it a good draught of water for his comfort. Some who never were out of their mother's kitchens may ask how these pirates could eat and digest those pieces of leather so hard and dry, whom I answer that could they once experiment what hunger or rather famine is, they would find the way as the pirates did. For these first sliced it in pieces, then they beat it between two stones, and rubbed it, often dipping it in water, to make it supple and tender. Lastly they scraped off the hair and broiled it. Being thus cooked, they cut it into small morsels and ate it, helping it down with frequent gulps of water, which by good fortune they had at hand. The fifth day, about noon, they came to a place called Barbacoa. Here they found traces of another ambuscade, but the place totally as unprovided as the former. At a small distance were several plantations, which they searched very narrowly, but could not find any person, animal, or other thing to relieve their extreme hunger. Finally, having ranged about and searched a long time, they found a grot, which seemed to be but lately hewn out of a rock, where were two sacks of meal, wheat, and like things, with two great jars of wine, and certain fruits called platanos. Captain Morgan, knowing some of his men were now almost dead with hunger, and fearing the same of the rest, 
caused what was found to be distributed among them who were in greatest necessity having refreshed themselves with these victuals they marched anew with greater courage than ever such as were weak were put into the canoes and those commanded to land that were in them before thus they prosecuted their journey till late at night when coming to a plantation they took up their rest but without eating anything for the spaniards as before had swept away all manner of provisions the sixth day they continued their march part by land and part by water howbeit they were constrained to rest very frequently both for the ruggedness of the way and their extreme weakness which they endeavoured to relieve by eating leaves of trees and green herbs or grass such was their miserable condition this day at noon they arrived at a plantation where was a barn full of maize immediately they beat down the doors and ate it dry as much as they could devour then they distributed a great quantity giving every man a good allowance thus provided and prosecuting their journey for about an hour they came to another ambuscade this they no sooner discovered but they threw away their maize with the sudden hopes of finding all things in abundance but they were much deceived meeting neither indians nor victuals nor anything else but they saw on the other side of the river about a hundred indians who all fleeing escaped some few pirates leaped into the river to cross it and try to take any of the indians but in vain for being much more nimble than the pirates they not only baffled them but killed two or three with their arrows hooting at them and crying ah perros a la savanna a la savanna ha ye dogs go to the plain go to the plain this day they could advance no farther being necessitated to pass the river to continue their march on the other side hereupon they reposed for that night though their sleep was not profound for great murmurings were made at captain morgan and his conduct some being desirous to return home while others would rather die there than go back a step from their undertaking others who had greater courage laughed and joked at their discourses meanwhile they had a guide who much comforted them saying it would not now be long before they met with people from whom they should reap some considerable advantage the seventh day in the morning they made clean their arms and every one discharged his pistol or musket without bullet to try their firelocks this done they crossed the river leaving the post where they had rested called santa cruz and at noon they arrived at a village called cruz being yet far from the place they perceived much smoke from the chimneys the sight hereof gave them great joy and hopes of finding people and plenty of good cheer thus they went on as fast as they could encouraging one another saying there is smoke comes out of every house they are making good fires to roast and boil what we are to eat and the like at length they arrived there all sweeting and panting but found no person in the town nor anything eatable to refresh themselves except good fires which they wanted not for the spaniards before their departure had every one set fire to his own house except the king's storehouses and stables they had not left behind them any beasts alive or dead which much troubled their minds not finding anything but a few cats and dogs which they immediately killed and devoured at last in the king's stables they found by good fortune fifteen or sixteen yards of peru wine and a leathern sack full of bread no sooner had they drunk of this wine when they fell sick almost every man this made them think the wine was poisoned which caused a new consternation in the whole camp judging themselves now to be irrecoverably lost but the true reason was their want of sustenance and the manifold sorts of trash they had eaten 
Their sickness was so great as caused them to remain there till the next morning, without being able to prosecute their journey in the afternoon. This village is seated nine degrees, two minutes north latitude, distant from the river Chagre twenty-six Spanish leagues, and eight from Panama. This is the last place to which boats or canoes can come, for which reason they built here storehouses for all sorts of merchandise, which to and from Panama are transported on the backs of mules. Here Captain Morgan was forced to leave his canoes, and land all his men, though never so weak. But lest the canoes should be surprised, or take up too many men for their defence, he sent them all back to the place where the boats were, except one, which he hid, that it might serve to carry intelligence. Many of the Spaniards and Indians of this village, having fled to the near plantations, Captain Morgan ordered that none should go out of the village, except companies of one hundred together, fearing lest the enemy should take an advantage upon his men. Notwithstanding one party contravened these orders, being tempted with the desire of victuals, but they were soon glad to fly into the town again, being assaulted with great fury by some Spaniards and Indians, who carried one of them away prisoner. Thus the vigilancy and care of Captain Morgan was not sufficient to prevent every accident. The eighth day in the morning, Captain Morgan sent two hundred men before the body of his army to discover the way to Panama and any ambuscades therein, the path being so narrow that only ten or twelve persons could march abreast, and often not so many. After ten hours' march they came to a place called Quebrada Obscura. Here all, on a sudden, three or four thousand arrows were shot at them, they not perceiving whence they came, or who shot them, though they presumed it was from a high rocky mountain from one side to the other, whereon was a grot, capable of but one horse or other beast laded. This multitude of arrows much alarmed the pirates, especially because they could not discover whence they were discharged. At last, seeing no more arrows, they marched a little farther, and entered a wood. Here they perceived some Indians to fly as fast as they could, to take the advantage of another post, thence to observe their march. Yet there remained one troop of Indians on the place, resolved to fight and defend themselves, which they did with great courage till their captain fell down wounded, who, though he despaired of life, yet his valour being greater than his strength, would ask no quarter, but endeavouring to raise himself, with undaunted mind laid hold of his asagayo, or javelin, and struck at one of the pirates. But before he could second the blow, he was shot to death. This was also the fate of many of his companions, who, like good soldiers, lost their lives with their captain for the defence of their country. End of chapter 17, part 1 Read by Lars Rolander Section 27 of Pirates of Panama The Buccaneers of America by A. O. Exquemelin Translated by G. A. Williams This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander Chapter 17, Part 2 The pirates endeavoured to take some of the Indians prisoners, but they being swifter than the pirates, every one escaped, leaving eight pirates dead and ten wounded. Yea, had the Indians been more dexterous in military affairs, they might have defended that passage and not let one man pass. A little while after they came to a large champagne, open and full of fine meadows. Hence they could perceive at a distance before them some Indians on the top of a mountain, near the way by which they were to pass. 
They sent fifty men, the nimblest they had, to try to catch any of them, and forced them to discover their companions. But all in vain, for they escaped by their nimbleness, and presently showed themselves in another place, hallooing to the English and crying, A la savanna, a la savanna, peros ingleses, that is, to the plain, to the plain, ye English dogs. Meanwhile the ten pirates that were wounded were dressed and plastered up. Here was a wood, and on each side a mountain. The Indians possessed themselves of one, and the pirates of the other. Captain Morgan was persuaded the Spaniards had placed an ambuscade there, it lying so conveniently. Hereupon he sent two hundred men to search it. The Spaniards and Indians, perceiving the pirates descend the mountain, did so too, as if they designed to attack them, but, being got into the wood, out of the sight of the pirates they were seen no more, leaving the passage open. About night fell a great rain, which caused the pirates to march the faster, and seek for houses to preserve their arms from being wet. But the Indians had set fire to every one, and driven away all their cattle, that the pirates, finding neither houses nor victuals, might be constrained to return. But after diligent search they found a few shepherds' huts, but in them nothing to eat. These not holding many men, they placed in them, out of every company, a small number, who kept the arms of the rest. Those who remained in the open field endured much hardship that night, the rain not ceasing till morning. Next morning, about break of day, being the ninth of that tedious journey, Captain Morgan marched on while the fresh air of the morning lasted, for the clouds hanging yet over their heads were much more favourable than the scorching rays of the sun, the way being now more difficult than before. After two hours' march, they discovered about twenty Spaniards, who observed their motions. They endeavoured to catch some of them, but could not, they suddenly disappearing, and absconding themselves in caves among the rocks, unknown to the pirates. At last, ascending a high mountain, they discovered the South Sea. This happy sight, as if it were the end of their labours, caused infinite joy among them. Hence they could descry also one ship and six boats, which were set forth from Panama, and sailed towards the islands of Tavoga and Tavogila. Then they came to a vale where they found much cattle, whereof they killed good store. Here, while some killed and flayed cows, horses, bulls, and chiefly asses, of which there were most. Others kindled fires and got wood to roast them, then cutting the flesh into convenient pieces or gobbets, they threw them into the fire, and half carbonated or roasted, they devoured them with incredible haste and appetite. Such was their hunger, as they more resembled cannibals than Europeans, the blood many times running down from their beards to their waists. Having satisfied their hunger, Captain Morgan ordered them to continue the march. Here again he sent before the main body fifty men to take some prisoners, if they could, for he was much concerned that in nine days he could not meet one person to inform him of the condition and forces of the Spaniards. About evening they discovered about two hundred Spaniards, who hallooed to the pirates, but they understood not what they said. A little while after they came in sight of the high steeple of Panama. This they no sooner discovered, but they showed signs of extreme joy, casting up their hats into the air, leaping and shouting, just as if they had already obtained the victory and accomplished their designs. All their trumpets sounded, and drums beat in token of this alacrity of their minds. Thus they pitched their camp for that night, with general content of the whole army, waiting with impatience for the morning, when they intended to attack the city. This evening appeared fifty horse, who came out of the city, 
on the noise of the drums and trumpets to observe, as it was thought, their motions. They came almost within musky shot of the army, with a trumpet that sounded marvellously well. Those on horseback hallooed aloud to the pirates, and threatened them, saying, Peros nos veremos, that is, ye dogs, we shall meet ye. Having made this menace, they returned to the city, except only seven or eight horsemen, who hovered thereabouts to watch their motions. Immediately after, the city fired and ceased not to play their biggest guns all night long against the camp, but with little or no harm to the pirates, whom they could not easily reach. Now also the two hundred Spaniards, whom the pirates had seen in the afternoon, appeared again, making a show of blocking up the passages that no pirates might escape their hands. But the pirates, though in a manner besieged, instead of fearing their blockades, as soon as they had placed sentinels about their camp, opened their satchels, and, without any napkins or plates, fell to eating very heartily the pieces of bulls and horses' flesh which they had reserved since noon. This done, they laid themselves down to sleep on the grass with great repose and satisfaction, expecting only with impatience the dawning of the next day. The tenth day, be times in the morning, they put all their men in order, and with drums and trumpets sounding, marched directly towards the city, but one of the guides desired Captain Morgan not to take the common highway, lest they should find in it many ambuscades. He took his advice and chose another way through the wood, though very irksome and difficult. The Spaniards, perceiving the pirates had taken another way they scarce had thought on, were compelled to leave their stops and batteries and come out to meet them. The governor of Panama put his forces in order, consisting of two squadrons, four regiments of foot, and a huge number of wild bulls, which were driven by a great number of Indians, with some negroes and others to help them. The pirates now upon their march came to the top of a little hill, whence they had a large prospect of the city and champagne country underneath. Here they discovered the forces of the people of Panama in battle array, to be so numerous that they were surprised with fear, much doubting the fortune of the day. Yea, few or none there were but wished themselves at home, or at least free from the obligation of that engagement, it so nearly concerning their lives. Having been some time wavering in their minds, they at last reflected on the straits they had brought themselves into, and that now they must either fight resolutely or die for no quarter could be expected from an enemy on whom they had committed so many cruelties. Hereupon they encouraged one another, resolving to conquer or spend the last drop of blood. Then they divided themselves into three battalions, sending before two hundred buccaneers who were very dexterous at their guns. Then, descending the hill, they marched directly towards the Spaniards, who in a spacious field waited for their coming. As soon as they drew nigh, the Spaniards began to shout and cry, Viva el Rey! God save the King! And immediately their horse moved against the pirates. But the fields being full of quags and soft underfoot, they could not wheel about as they desired. The two hundred buccaneers who went before, each putting one knee to the ground, began the battle briskly, with a full volley of shot. The Spaniards defended themselves courageously, doing all they could to disorder the pirates. Their foot endeavoured to second the horse, but were constrained by the pirates to leave them. Finding themselves baffled, they attempted to drive the bulls against them behind, to put them into disorder. But the wild cattle ran away, frightened with the noise of the battle. Only some few broke through the English companies, and only tore the colours in pieces, while the buccaneers shot every one of them dead. The battle having continued two hours, the greatest part of the Spanish horse was ruined, and almost all killed, 
the rest fled which the foot seeing and that they could not possibly prevail they discharged the shot they had in their muskets and throwing them down fled away every one as he could the pirates could not follow them being too much harassed and wearied with their long journey many not being able to fly whither they desired hid themselves for that present among the shrubs of the seaside but very unfortunately for most of them being found by the pirates were instantly killed without any quarter some religious men were brought prisoners before captain morgan but he being deaf to their cries commanded them all to be pistoled which was done soon after they brought a captain to him whom he examined very strictly particularly wherein consisted the forces of those of panama he answered their whole strength consisted in four hundred horse twenty-four companies of foot each of one hundred men complete sixty indians and some negroes who were to drive two thousand wild bulls upon the english and thus by breaking their files put them into a total disorder beside that in the city they had made trenches and raised batteries in several places in all which they had placed many guns and that at the entry of the highway leading to the city they had built a fort mounted with eight great brass guns defended by fifty men captain morgan having heard this gave orders instantly to march another way but first he made a review of his men whereof he found both killed and wounded a considerable number and much greater than had been believed of the spaniards were found six hundred dead on the place besides the wounded and prisoners the pirates nothing discouraged seeing their number so diminished but rather filled with greater pride perceiving what huge advantage they had obtained against their enemies having rested some time prepared to march courageously towards the city plighting their oaths to one another that they would fight till not a man was left alive with this courage they recommenced their march either to conquer or be conquered carrying with them all the prisoners they found much difficulty in their approach to the city for within the town the spaniards had placed many great guns at several quarters some charged with small pieces of iron and others with mosquito bullets with all these they saluted the pirates at their approaching and gave them full and frequent broadsides firing at them incessantly so that unavoidably they lost at every step great numbers of men but these manifest dangers of their lives nor the sight of so many as dropped continually at their sides could deter them from advancing and gaining ground every moment on the enemy and though the spaniards never ceased to fire and act the best they could for their defence yet they were forced to yield after three hours combat and the pirates having possessed themselves killed and destroyed all that attempted in the least to oppose them the inhabitants had transported the best of their goods to more remote and occult places howbeit they found in the city several warehouses well stocked with merchandise as well silks and clothes as linen and other things of value as soon as the first fury of their entrance was over captain morgan assembled his men and commanded them under great penalties not to drink or taste any wine and the reason he gave for it was because he had intelligence that it was all poisoned by the spaniards howbeit it was thought he gave these prudent orders to prevent the debauchery of his people which he foresaw would be very great at the first after so much hunger sustained by the way fearing withal lest the spaniards seeing them in wine should rally and falling on the city use them as inhumanly as they had used the inhabitants before end of chapter 17 part 2 read by lars rolander
Section 28 of The Pirates of Panama The Buccaneers of America by A. O. Excamela Translated by G. A. Williams This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Dennis Sayers Chapter 18 Captain Morgan sends canoes and boats to the South Sea. He fires the city of Panama. Robberies and cruelties committed there by the pirates till their return to the castle of Chagre. Captain Morgan, as soon as he had placed necessary guards at several quarters, within and without the city, commanded twenty-five men to seize a great boat, which had stuck in the mud of the port, for want of water, at a low tide. The same day, about noon, he caused fire, privately, to be set to several great edifices of the city, nobody knowing who were the authors thereof, much less on what motives Captain Morgan did it, which are unknown to this day. The fire increased so, that before night the greatest part of the city was in flame. Captain Morgan pretended the Spaniards had done it, perceiving that his own people reflected on him for that action. Many of the Spaniards, and some of the pirates, did what they could, either to quench the flame, or by blowing up houses with gunpowder, and pulling down others, to stop it, but in vain for in less than half an hour it consumed a whole street. All the houses of the city were built with cedar, very curious and magnificent, and richly adorned, especially with hangings and paintings, whereof part were before removed, and another great part were consumed by fire. There were in the city, which is the see of a bishop, eight monasteries, seven for men and one for women, two stately churches and one hospital. The churches and monasteries were all richly adorned with altar-pieces and paintings, much gold and silver, and other precious things, all which the ecclesiastics had hidden. Besides which, here were two thousand houses of magnificent building, the greatest part inhabited by merchants vastly rich. For the rest, of less quality, and tradesmen, this city contained five thousand more. Here were also many stables for the horses and mules that carried the plate of the King of Spain, as well as private men, toward the North Sea. The neighboring fields are full of fertile plantations and pleasant gardens, affording delicious prospects to the inhabitants all the year. The Genoese had in this city a stately house for their trade of negroes. This likewise was by Captain Morgan burnt to the very ground. Besides which building, there were consumed two hundred warehouses, and many slaves who had hid themselves therein with innumerable sacks of meal, the fire of which continued four weeks after it had begun. The greatest part of the pirates still encamped without the city, fearing and expecting the Spaniards would come and fight them anew. It being known, they much outnumbered the pirates. This made them keep the field, to preserve their forces united, now much diminished by their losses. Their wounded, which were many, they put into one church, which remained standing, the rest being consumed by the fire. Besides these decreases of their men, Captain Morgan had sent a convoy of one hundred and fifty men to the castle of Chagre, to carry the news of his victory at Panama. They saw often whole troops of Spaniards run to and fro in the fields, which made them suspect their rallying which they never had the courage to do. In the afternoon, Captain Morgan re-entered the city with his troops, 
that every one might take up their lodgings, which now they could hardly find, few houses having escaped the fire. Then they sought very carefully among the ruins and ashes for utensils or plate or gold that were not quite wasted by the flames, and of such they found no small number, especially in wells and cisterns where the Spaniards had hid them. Next day, Captain Morgan dispatched away two troops of one hundred and fifty men each, stout and well armed, to seek for the inhabitants who were escaped. These, having made several excursions up and down the fields, woods, and mountains adjacent, returned after two days, bringing above two hundred prisoners, men, women, and slaves. The same day returned also the boat which Captain Morgan had sent to the South Sea, bringing three other boats which they had taken. But all these prizes they could willingly have given, and greater labor into the bargain for one galleon, which miraculously escaped, richly laden with all the king's plate, jewels, and other precious goods of the best and richest merchants of Panama on board which were also the religious women of the nunnery, who had embarked with them all the ornaments of their church, consisting in much gold, plate, and other things of great value. The strength of this galleon was inconsiderable, having only seven guns and ten or twelve muskets, and very ill provided with victuals, necessaries, and fresh water having no more sails than the uppermost of the mainmast. This account the pirates received from some one who had spoken with seven mariners belonging to the galleon, who came ashore in the cockboat for fresh water. Hence they concluded they might easily have taken it, had they given her chase, as they should have done. But they were impeded from following this vastly rich prize, by their gluttony and drunkenness, having plentifully debauched themselves with several rich wines they found ready, choosing rather to satiate their appetites than to lay hold on such huge advantage, since this only prize would have been a far greater value than all they got at Panama and the places thereabout. Next day, repenting of their negligence, being weary of their vices and debaucheries, they set forth another boat, well armed, to pursue with all speed the said galleon, but in vain. The Spaniards, who were on board, having had intelligence of their own danger one or two days before, while the pirates were cruising so near them, whereupon they fled to places more remote and unknown. The pirates found, in the ports of the island of Tavoga and Tavogilla, several boats laden with very good merchandise, all which they took and brought to Panama, where they made an exact relation of all that had passed to Captain Morgan. The prisoners confirmed what the pirates said, adding that they undoubtedly knew where the galleon might then be, but that it was very probable they had been relieved before now from other places. This stirred up Captain Morgan anew to send forth all the boats in the port of Panama to seek the said galleon till they could find her. These boats, being in all four, after eight days cruising to and fro and searching several ports and creeks, lost all hopes of finding her. Hereupon, they returned to Tavoga and Tavogilla. Here they found a reasonable good ship, newly come from Peta, laden with cloth, soap, sugar, and biscuit, with twenty thousand pieces of eight. This they instantly seized, without the least resistance, as also a boat which was not far off, on which they laded great part of the merchandises from the ship, with some slaves. With this purchase they returned to Panama, somewhat better satisfied, yet withal much discontented that they could not meet with the galleon. 
The convoy which Captain Morgan had sent to the castle of Chagre returned much about the same time, bringing with them very good news. For while Captain Morgan was on his journey to Panama, those he had left in the castle of Chagre had sent for two boats to cruise. These met with a Spanish ship, which they chased within sight of the castle. This being perceived by the pirates in the castle, they put forth Spanish colors to deceive the ship that fled before the boats, and the poor Spaniards, thinking to take refuge under the castle, were caught in a snare and made prisoners. The cargo on board the said vessel consisted in victuals and provisions, than which nothing could be more opportune for the castle, where they began already to want things of this kind. This good luck of those of Chagre caused Captain Morgan to stay longer at Panama, ordering several new excursions into the country round about. And while the pirates at Panama were upon these expeditions, those at Chagre were busy in piracies on the North Sea, Captain Morgan sent forth, daily, parties of two hundred men to make inroads into all the country round about, and when one party came back, another went forth, who soon gathered much riches and many prisoners. These being brought into the city were put to the most exquisite tortures to make them confess both other people's goods and their own. Here it happened that one poor wretch was found in the house of a person of quality, who had put on, amidst the confusion, a pair of taffety breeches of his master's, with a little silver key hanging out. Perceiving which, they asked him for the cabinet of the said key. His answer was, he knew not what was become of it, but that finding those breeches in his master's house, he had made bold to wear them. Not being able to get any other answer, they put him on the rack, and inhumanly disjointed his arms. Then they twisted a cord about his forehead, which they wrung so hard that his eyes appeared as big as eggs, and were ready to fall out. But with these torments not obtaining any positive answer, they hung him up by the wrists, giving him many blows and stripes under that intolerable pain and posture of body. Afterwards they cut off his nose and ears, and singed his face with burning straw, till he could not speak, nor lament his misery any longer. Then, losing all hopes of any confession, they bade a negro run him through, which put an end to his life, and to their inhuman tortures. Thus did many others of those miserable prisoners finish their days, the common sport and recreation of these pirates being such tragedies. Captain Morgan, having now been at Panama full three weeks, commanded all things to be prepared for his departure. He ordered every company of men to seek so many beasts of carriage as might convey the spoil to the river where his canoes lay. About this time there was a great rumor that a considerable number of pirates intended to leave Captain Morgan, and that, taking a ship then in port, they determined to go and rob on the South Sea, till they got as much as they thought fit, and then return homewards, by way of the West Indies, for which purpose they had gathered much provisions, which they had hid in private places, with sufficient powder, bullets, and all other ammunition, likewise some great guns belonging to the town, muskets, and other things, wherewith they designed not only to equip their vessel, but to fortify themselves in some island which might serve them for a place of refuge. This design had certainly taken effect, had not Captain Morgan had timely advice of it from one of their comrades. Hereupon he commanded the mainmast of the said ship, to be cut down and burnt, with all the other boats in the port. Hereby the intentions of all, or most of his companions, were totally frustrated. Then Captain Morgan sent many of the Spaniards into the adjoining fields, 
and country, to seek for money, to ransom not only themselves, but the rest of the prisoners, as likewise the ecclesiastics. Moreover, he commanded all the artillery of the town to be nailed and stopped up. At the same time, he sent out a strong company of men to seek for the governor of Panama, of whom intelligence was brought that he had laid several ambuscades in the way by which he ought to return. But they returned soon after, saying they had not found any sign of such ambuscades. For confirmation whereof, they brought some prisoners, who declared that the said governor had had an intention of making some opposition by the way, but that the men designed to effect it were unwilling to undertake it, so that for want of means he could not put his design in execution. February 24th, 1671, Captain Morgan departed from Panama, or rather from the place where the city of Panama stood. Of the spoils whereof he carried with him, one hundred and seventy-five beasts of carriage, laden with silver, gold, and other precious things, beside about six hundred prisoners, men, women, children, and slaves. That day they came to a river that passes through a delicious plain, a league from Panama. Here Captain Morgan put all his forces into good order, so that the prisoners were in the middle, surrounded on all sides with pirates, where nothing else was to be heard but lamentations, cries, shrieks, and doleful sighs of so many women and children, who feared Captain Morgan designed to transport them all into his own country for slaves. Besides, all those miserable prisoners endured extreme hunger and thirst at that time, which misery Captain Morgan designedly caused them to sustain to excite them to seek for money to ransom themselves, according to the tax he had set upon every one. Many of the women begged Captain Morgan on their knees with infinite sighs and tears to let them return to Panama, there to live with their dear husbands and children in little huts of straw which they would erect, seeing they had no houses till the rebuilding of the city. But... His answer was, He came not thither to hear lamentations and cries, but to seek money. Therefore they ought first to seek out that, wherever it was to be had, and bring it to him. Otherwise he would assuredly transport them all to such places whither they cared not to go. Next day, when the march began, those lamentable cries and shrieks were renewed, so as it would have caused compassion in the hardest heart. But Captain Morgan, as a man little given to mercy, was not moved in the least. They marched in the same order as before, one party of the pirates in the van, the prisoners in the middle, and the rest of the pirates in the rear by whom the miserable Spaniards were at every step punched and thrust in their backs and sides, with the blunt ends of their arms, to make them march faster. A beautiful lady, wife to one of the richest merchants of Tavoga, was led prisoner by herself between two pirates. Her lamentations pierced the skies, seeing herself carried away into captivity, often crying to the pirates, and telling them that she had given orders to two religious persons, in whom she had relied, to go to a certain place and fetch so much money as her ransom did amount to, that they had promised faithfully to do it, but, having obtained the money, instead of bringing it to her, they had employed it another way, to ransom some of their own and particular friends. This ill action of theirs was discovered by a slave, who brought a letter to the said lady. Her complaints, and the cause thereof, being brought to Captain Morgan, he thought fit to inquire thereinto. Having found it to be true, especially hearing it confirmed by the confession of the said religious men, though under some frivolous exercises 
of having diverted the money but for a day or two, in which time they expected more sums to repay it, he gave liberty to the said lady, whom otherwise he designed to transport to Jamaica. But he detained the said religious men as prisoners in her place, using them according to their deserts. Captain Morgan, arriving at the town called Cruz, on the banks of the river Chagre, he published an order among the prisoners that within three days every one should bring in their ransom under the penalty of being transported to Jamaica. Meanwhile, he gave orders for so much rice and maize to be collected thereabouts as was necessary for victualling his ships. Here some of the prisoners were ransomed, but many others could not bring in their money. Hereupon he continued his voyage, leaving the village on the 5th of March following, carrying with him all the spoil he could. Hence he likewise led away some new prisoners, inhabitants there, with those in Panama, who had not paid their ransom. But the two religious men, who had diverted the lady's money, were ransomed three days after by other persons, who had more compassion for them than they had showed for her. About the middle of the way to Chagre, Captain Morgan commanded them to be mustered, and caused every one to be sworn that they had concealed nothing, even not to the value of sixpence. This done, Captain Morgan, knowing those lewd fellows would not stick to swear falsely for interest, he commanded every one to be searched very strictly both in their clothes and satchels, and elsewhere. Yea, that this order might not be taken ill by his companions, he permitted himself to be searched, even to his very shoes. To this effect, by common consent, one was assigned out of every company to be searchers of the rest. The French pirates that assisted on this expedition disliked this new practice of searching, but, being outnumbered by the English, they were forced to submit as well as the rest. The search being over, they re-embarked, and arrived at the castle of Chagre on the ninth of March. Here they found all things in good order, excepting the wounded men whom they had left at their departure, for of these the greatest number were dead of their wounds. From Chagre, Captain Morgan sent, presently after his arrival, a great boat to Puerto Bello, with all the prisoners taken at the Isle of St. Catherine, demanding of them a considerable ransom for the castle of Chagre, where he then was, threatening, otherwise, to ruin it. To this those of Puerto Bello answered, they would not give one farthing towards the ransom of the said castle, and the English might do with it as they pleased. Hereupon the dividend was made of all the spoil made in that voyage, every company and every particular person therein receiving their proportion, or rather, what part thereof Captain Morgan pleased to give them, for the rest of his companions even of his own nation, murmured at his proceedings, and told him to his face that he had reserved the best jewels to himself, for they judged it impossible that no greater share should belong to them than two hundred pieces of eight, per capita, of so many valuable plunders they had made, which small sum they thought too little for so much labor, and such dangers, as they had been exposed to. But Captain Morgan was deaf to all this, and many other like complaints, having designed to cheat them of what he could. At last, finding himself obnoxious to many censures of his people, and fearing the consequence, he thought it unsafe to stay any longer at Chagra, but ordered the ordnance of the castle to be carried on board his ship. Then he caused most of the walls to be demolished, the edifices to be burnt, and as many other things ruined 
as could be done in a short time. This done, he went secretly on board his own ship, without giving any notice to his companions, and put out to sea, being only followed by three or four vessels of the whole fleet. These were such, as the French pirates believed, as went shares with Captain Morgan in the best part of the spoil, which had been concealed from them in the dividend. The Frenchmen could willingly have revenged themselves on Captain Morgan and his followers, had they been able to encounter him at sea. But they were destitute of necessaries, and had much ado to find sufficient provisions for their voyage to Jamaica. He, having left them unprovided for all things. End of chapter 18 End of Pirates of Panama by A. O. Excamillan Translated by G. A. Williams Read for LibriVox by Dennis Sayers In Modesto, California Winter 2008